Welcome everybody to another episode of Pathfinder. My name is Tommy Soares. I'm Assistant Director of the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology and Infectious Disease. And today on Pathfinder, I have the pleasure of welcoming Adam Myers, who's the Senior Project Ma Manager at Evonik, uh, right here in Lafayette, Indiana. Adam, thank you so much for being on the program and for joining us and being our Pathfinder today. Thanks so much. It's really good to get to uh, be here as I talk virtually with you. If I would look across the way, uh, uh, there's Purdue right across. So we're, we're uh, geographically right. pretty close today, too. Exactly. Exactly. It's so good to have you guys in town. I... I'm so excited to talk to you because I know you've been quite active in trying to recruit people, uh, trying to uh, tell people about the different opportunities in Evonik and, you know, all of this um, uh, real opportunities that present themselves here in Indiana. And I, I think, you know, it's, it's great to have people like you that are, you know, on, uh, have had this journey in science, but you get to also be the one that helps to uh, promote science, promote these careers and help people, uh, you know, uh, be successful. So I am thrilled to talk to you today. And I, I want to thank you for uh, being a sport and uh, coming on the program. And I guess, you know, maybe as we do always, can you take us back to what was your journey into science? And, uh, you know, we can go from there. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I grew up here in the state of Indiana uh, from a little town to Whiteland, just south of Indianapolis, and I grew up on a family farm. So, uh, you know, it was around a lot of things. Uh, but in addition to the farm, which taught me a lot of hard work ethic, which you need in science. Uh, and I also, you know, there's science involved in, in plant sciences and in, uh, in herbicides that you can use. Uh, so I was involved a little bit early on, but I also had a lot of family members that were in the medical field. So my mother and both my grandmothers uh, and several other relatives were nurses. Uh, my grandfather had founded the EMT program back in my home county when it started. Um, and so I always had this uh, inkling that I wanted to impact human health but I didn't wanna deal directly with sick people. Uh, so uh, really uh, the other neat thing was for me that I, you know, I, I fell in love with chemistry. Uh, really, I always kind of liked it and, and that coalesced in eighth grade, I'd say, uh, that I really liked chemistry. And that was because I had a really great physical sciences teacher in eighth grade and uh, uh, Mr. Burgess was his name. And, and he was really, that exposed me to this whole thing of chemistry and then you couple that with uh, just up the road in Indianapolis, there's this company known as Eli Lilly that uh, is a pharmaceutical company. And I learned through some other friends, parents that worked there and some acquaintances that worked there that, oh, I could help people and I could make an impact on human health, but I didn't have to deal directly with sick people. And so uh, I thought this is, this is the path for me. And so, uh, so that really is when I really fell in love with that. Uh, loved chemistry. It was always something that was that was fun to me, uh, not just for being able to make things that, you know, like make fireworks and other things like that, that, that of course, every chemist, whether they admit it or not, really likes to do. Uh, but so I, so I found out about this and I had a chance to uh, to explore this. And uh, so, of course, I'm looking at undergrad schools, you know, this is the, the mid nineties, uh, I'm looking at undergrad schools. My dad's a Purdue alum and I knew other, other folks that were Boilermakers as well. Uh, and so I thought, you know, this is, this is a great place. It's a top chemistry school. And you know, I looked around, even looked at some of the research catalogs that were for some of the grad things. And I thought, this is the place, this is the place to be. Uh, the fact that I was really involved in a lot of music things and other things in my hometown, some people were surprised. A few of them thought I might go to that other school and major in music or something. But uh, I said, no, no, I'm going to I'm going to work in science and I'm going to go to Purdue, uh, where, of course, I still got to do a lot of music, which was fun. Uh, so I, I studied chemistry at Purdue, uh, did my undergrad in uh, honors chem and biochem. Uh, 
And then the thing that was neat for me is I had a chance to do some internships in industry. I always had in mind, didn't want to be a professor. For me, it was about working in the pharmaceutical industry or something helping human health. And so I had chances to intern, which I always advocate for people uh, to do. Whether or not you think you want industry, it can either confirm you like it or confirm that you don't like it. So I always tell people, at least get one internship as an undergrad. Um, so I had a chance to work at, uh, actually at Lilly, uh, in three different summers. I worked there after my sophomore, junior, and senior years, I did a few different jobs, and that really confirmed to me, yes, I want to do, uh, this is what I want to do. I, I had enjoyed my undergrad research that I had a chance to do at Purdue, and I, but I knew that I really wanted to aim, aim to industry. And I also got a chance to see the type of jobs that I wanted to do were the ones that were being done by PhD scientists. So that told me, all right, yeah, I definitely want to go to grad school. And I, I pretty much, I was thinking that all along, but uh, again, as I do some stuff, I do some career consulting with the ACS. And as I always tell people, don't just get the degree just because someone tells you to get it, get it because it's what you need to do the work you want to do. Uh, and so I, I had a chance to realize, yes, I want industry, but the industry jobs I want are going to be PhD level jobs. And so uh, looked at grad schools, uh, applied literally coast to coast for grad schools. And this was a time, again, you know, we're, we're dealing, uh, there were no electronic applications as much. Uh, I was sending in paperwork. Uh, in fact, one school, uh, something that doesn't happen nowadays, I and mean, maybe a spam folder gets it, but actually one of the schools that I'd applied to did not receive a second mailing that I had to do uh, for, for part of my application. And it turns out, I mean, it, you know, this was all, you know, the, the right path for me because that school, uh, some of the people that I'd been interested in there were actually retiring and one had become department head and was going to be out after that. So didn't even waste my time. Uh, so I, I looked coast to coast. I, I checked out some different schools. Uh, but again, uh, I came right back to Purdue. Uh, and, and so this was where I had looked at grad school catalogs and looked at research that was happening at Purdue when I chose it as an undergrad. So I, in some ways, I sort of chose my grad school when I chose my undergrad. Um, and, and I figure too, you know, if I looked at the academic pedigree of some others, uh, Ich Nagishi went to the same undergrad and grad school. So I figure I can do that too. Uh, and there were some <laughs> others. Um, and so, so I went to Purdue, uh, stayed on for grad school and, and did research in uh, in chemistry there, synthetic organic chemistry, uh, got my PhD. And so, of course, starting before 9-11 and then after, some economic things were a little bit different. And uh, also economic downturns were kind of around. So the jobs at big companies like Lilly or, or P&G or some others that I thought about doing, uh, you know, they weren't as available when I was finishing up uh, in 2005. So uh, I started looking around at some other places and looked at some interesting options that were there. I mean, I didn't interviewed at a few places and several places. Uh, we don't have jobs right now. Uh, but there's this little place up the road from Purdue called the Research Park. And so I went to a job fair there. I knew of a few companies that were there. Obviously, having been in the chemistry department, of course, I knew about Endocyte and about, at the time, Griffin Analytical. You know, some of my undergrad professors, some of my professors founded these companies. And uh, and so, and I, and I knew as well about, you know, several other companies in the research park. And I thought, well, this is a great place. Let me go check out a job fair that they had there. So I went in person to this job fair and, uh, you know, I talked to a few companies that I knew of, but then, um, and I saw, I saw another company, a company called Quadrispec, which was founded by another Purdue chemistry professor, Fred Rainier, along with David Nolte, who is a physics professor. And I, and I thought, well, you know, they're an analytical company. They don't, they're not even an organic chemist. But one of my grad school classmates actually had talked to them. He was in a different field and he said, hey, Adam, you should talk to these guys. They need somebody to do synthesis stuff. I said, okay. So um, so I did, I talked to um, the person recruiting there, uh, ended up being my boss uh, for the time I was there. Uh, and, and they needed someone to do surface chemistry synthesis on medical diagnostic devices. So. It was a little bit different route, but yet again, something that I thought, well, this is this is really neat. I'm helping detect 
diseases early. So I got to help develop some surface chemistry for a device. Uh, it at that point in time, you know, as as some companies do, you hire a lot of people. You I was employee number eleven actually there. Uh, you also go through different funding routes, and sometimes you lay off people. I got to lay some. Pe I hired people. I was hired. I had to lay some people off. I got laid off too. Uh, I mean, that's just the cycle of it. So I was there for just shy of two years. Uh, but for me, I was so industry focused. The idea of, I figured like, well, that's basically like my postdoc. So there you go. Uh, for some people, if we compare it to the academic uh, market. And so, you know, then again, and the thing that I kept seeing is, okay, I need to make sure I don't close any doors myself. And of course, so I knew also about um, BASI which was there in the research park, Bioanalytical Systems. Now they're, they're now called Innotive. Um, and so I knew about them, but uh, I thought, well, again, they're an analytical company. I knew a bunch of people that had been there. Of course, I knew Dr. Kissinger, uh, who's the founder. Uh, and so I thought, well, you know, I, I kept looking around. But I thought, I don't know, would they need me? But again, I uh, got referred by, in this case, uh, at the time, my girlfriend, now my wife, uh, her one of her co-workers at the school she taught at, uh, her husband was there and he said, here's a job that would be really great for Adam. And so it was two months from uh, from when I was laid off to when I started there. Uh, perfect timing, uh, you know, really blessed with, with that. I actually got to help my dad finish harvest on the farm and I was applying for jobs. Uh, I literally took a phone interview from a grain truck. Uh, and so uh, there are definitely some interesting uh, things there. Uh, but again, it was an opportunity. I didn't know if they would need my skills, but turns out um, you don't want to box yourself in because as a synthetic organic chemist, I was trained to be a problem solver. And I was trained to think about you know, what things would be. And of course, I'd had to analyze all the compounds I made. I had to characterize them. So I was already familiar with these techniques and they needed somebody to work with pharmaceutical companies to do analysis. So I worked in GMP analytical there. I, I worked with products that were early phase discovery, doing support of dose formulations in tox studies, all the way up to commercial stability and release of products. And so I had a chance to work there and that was really fulfilling it was something that i enjoyed being close to that patient and and seeing okay this is something that's going to be impacting someone um whether it be it's a drug that i knew someone took or you know as we were getting ready to have even our first child and my wife's thinking about epidurals i was like oh yeah i've tested those that's okay and she quickly reminded me the large needle is the thing she was more worried about <laughs> than the uh, actual uh drugs for that yeah so i had a chance i worked there for about seven years uh it was it was really good uh, made a lot of great connections there uh ended up leading their gmp analytical lab and uh and got some great experience in analytical, as well as really venturing into this area of drug performance, things like dissolution, extended release of drugs, robustness of that, in vitro bioequivalence, and really kind of made a niche for myself doing some things in that area, uh, and was recruited by, by actually, uh, at this point in time, was recruited to a company that uh, locally known more as SSCI. It's had a few different parent company names founded by Steve Byrne in the uh, industrial pharmacy department. And so I was recruited uh, by a person who was the husband of one of my former employees, actually. Uh, so his wife had worked uh, in my department for a little bit when I was leading it and uh, had great relationship with them. So uh, you know, I was talking with, with John and, and he uh, recruited me over there. Uh, we were talking and had a great opportunity to help form and lead a group focused on that drug performance. So again, still in that, getting a little more than back into uh, you know, some things beyond just more of the GMP analytical, but doing some more uh, you know, things like uh, abuse deterrence work and, and other things with drugs to really help make sure that we would produce safe medications that were going to be helpful. The other thing I got to do there was actually through some of this expertise I developed over time, uh, one of the things we did uh, was support patent litigation. And so 
I had a chance to start doing some expert witnessing for patent litigation. Uh, and you know, some cases are, I'm still involved in some cases actually from when I was there. Uh, but so I've been a chance to do that and really explore even just some of the intricacies of what does it take to patent a drug? What does it take to have a good patent on a drug that's gonna allow you to, to really uh, you know, make that drug something that you can get a return on your investment so that you can continue to make the next giant leaps to quote Purdue uh, in, uh, in our drug discovery and everything else. So had a chance to do that and that was really exciting um, to be part of that. Uh, but th there was definitely a time was coming there that you know, as, as things shifted, I was looking for some other opportunities and uh, a friend of mine who had come to work at Ivonic as a project manager uh, that I had actually recruited in uh, to BASI when I was there. Uh, my friend Mike, uh, he contacted me and said, hey, Adam, there's some opportunities coming up here. I think it would be great uh, for you. And so as I got talking, I thought, this is, this is definitely a good fit. I already was managing projects. Uh, I still like that scientific management of things. And so I got the chance to to join here at Ivonic as a project manager. Um, so I'm a senior project manager in what's our drug substance business. So uh, that means the active ingredient, the API of a drug. So uh, I had the chance to come here and join the Ivonic team. And so what I get to do now, while I've worked in things from very early phase, uh, the stuff we're doing now, we are scaling up and we are taking drugs, you know, from maybe in our pilot plant all the way up to equipment that it's like a reactor. It's not. It's not a little round bottom flask anymore. It's a four thousand gallon reactor, making commercial scale levels of a drug. And again, be, being close to the patient, helping to provide things, knowing that the work I do is helping to get drugs safely and effectively to the market, and at the end of the day, making that impact in human health. It's it's huge, and it's interesting. Every step along the way has been a bit of that networking. So that journey that I've had, even my first job at, at Eli Lilly was through someone my dad knew. My dad is a farmer, knew uh, he was a, a person who was in the community. And I got introduced to him and he said, hey, I know of somebody who is looking for some summer help at Lilly. And, and so all the way back to there to now, it's been that personal connection. And uh, and that got re me really interested in doing things as I serve my profession. Uh, I've been involved in the American Chemical Society for quite some time. I, I was involved as this undergrad student affiliate. I'm currently the chair of our local section now here uh, for the Purdue local section. So for all of you chemists out there uh, that are getting this, you've probably gotten emails from me uh, on that. <laughs> uh, but I, I so I've, I've had a chance to do that. And one of the ways I've, I've served on national committees uh, since 2001, I've actually had a chance to serve nationally with the ACS. Uh, but the thing that I've really become very passionate about, and it's always something I did naturally, is that career development for people and to try to help people find that right path for them. Because I sure had people help me along the way, and I want to be able to do that. So I serve uh, in the ACS as a career consultant and a career pathway facilitator. And so it's just something that's passionate. Uh, if you're connected with me on LinkedIn, as uh, Tommy, you noted, uh, I try to advocate for, for jobs that are around because we've got some great opportunities to put skills to use. Um, and I want to have chances to do that. And so uh, it's been a really great thing to do. And at a company like Ivonic, it's been really good because we do a lot of the development of our people. Uh, and so that's been a lot of fun. So I enjoy uh, getting to do this and, and I'll admit, I'm enjoying not being a direct hiring manager right now. As a project manager, I lead teams of people, but I'm not having to deal with some of the HR process. So I get back to more of my organic chemistry here, still you know, knowing that analytical is great, but a lot of my organic chemistry roots, I'm really uh, digging deeper into those and I still get to help do uh, some career development type things for folks. And um, so yeah, that's kind of where I'm at and the journey that's gotten me here so far. And, and I love the your enthusiasm as you were taking us through that uh, trajectory. It's it's, it's uh, contagious. It's really great, and I I'm so I'm so thrilled to be able to you know 
get into some of these like uh, probably gems that we need to uncover with you. Tell us, tell us a little bit about you called him Mr. Burgess, your mm -hmm. early inspiration. I think there are a lot of people that can probably think back and there was an early teacher. I know I certainly can uh, think back and go and say, oh, there were, there was a couple of teachers that really had an impact on me. Tell us about Mr. Burgess and, and what was that impact? Yeah, he was, um, so he was a physical sciences teacher. So he taught eighth grade. Uh, and that's where in the state of Indiana, we do physical sciences more. And so uh, part physics, part chemistry. Uh, but that's where I got to really do, uh, this first time we really got to do real lab experiments. There were some actual chemicals there, not just you know mixing up something at home and making your baking soda volcano, which those are fun. I, I, had, I got to do a science fair project with my, my older son recently, and we were doing Mentos and soft drinks and having a blast, quite literally. Uh, but so Mr. Burgess, I think he was a very gentle spirit. And he always was open to you asking questions. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to learn more, um, he could do that. Uh, but we got to, he really blended the experimental in well with the you know the the lecture type things and i think that was really neat uh, you know some people don't do that as well some people it's a lot of lecture and then oh go do this lab or here's a worksheet and and so uh you know we did worksheets we did all that stuff uh but i think it was the fact that we had good experiments that we got to do and and just got that first exposure and that's where i got this bug of like chemistry that's for me yeah. So that that's that's kind of where it was. But and, you know, he was a great person and you could talk to him easily. And yeah. I think being approachable and being available are things that any of us can do. Yeah. And and he did that during that context. And so that was something that was really and, special. And do you remember him providing any words of encouragement or was his attitude something that you're like, oh, that's that's, you know, really, I, I feel good about myself being in his class. You know, I. I honestly don't remember. It has been a long time <laughs> since uh, the late 80s and uh, early maybe 1990. So it's been a little while. Uh, so I don't remember a lot of specifics, but uh, I just remember he was always in, an encourager and he would always take time if you had questions. And I think that was great because I was always a kid who wanted to know why. Uh, it, I might want to know a little deeper. And he was he was fine with asking that. Uh, so I really appreciated that. Yeah. And so as you as you started to, I mean, it's what's incredible, Adam, is and again, like sometimes you have these and like you examples where people from early on, they knew you knew that chemistry was for you, as you said, and to have that realization and be able to then use that as a way to focus and, and continue in your career. Tell us, you know, like I, as you were going through your progress at Purdue and, and, you know, like getting exposed to not only chemistry and laboratory chemistry, but also, as you said, this analytical chemistry component that at Purdue is so rich. Um, tell, tell us a little bit about what was that eye opener and, and how, how do you think that's helped you shape your career so far? Yeah, I, you know, I think there's a few things with that. First of all, getting to come to Purdue and seeing all the research that's going on in all the groups that were there. I mean, just in the chemistry department alone, which is my first exposure, and then you know, being in a research group that was part of the cancer center, so then you, you expand out more and you find all of these areas of research that are happening. I mean, it was just amazing to me, all of the doors that that opened. Um, I was really blessed that at the time, uh, my sophomore year organic uh, class uh, for the honors majors, uh, they made an opportunity for us because uh, um, he was still alive and coming in the department at the time. Uh, we got to go sit and visit with H.C. Brown when we got to hydroboration. And 
to to be in the what was the Brown Archives with a Nobel laureate learning about the chemistry that made him a Nobel laureate from him. That was amazing. And yeah. I just remember that impact. And and I think our faculty at Purdue always have done a very good job of again, you know, investing in students. And so, you know, he was a big deal. He didn't have to do that. Yeah. Uh, but he enjoyed it. And and I was really thankful for experiences like that. I, I TA'd at one point for uh, Ich Nagishi, who, again, Dr. Nagishi, the next Purdue Chemistry Nobel Laureate. Um, I, these were experiences that I'm hearing reactions like the Nagishi reaction, Fuchs reaction, Corey Fuchs reaction. They're named and my professor's name is in an organic reaction that's known. I, I mean, that was amazing. Yeah. And then when I it was getting into analytical and I learned so much about the analytical, I would just... Um, whether it was uh, an early uh, kind of bioanalytical type class I took and I got to have uh, learned that from Fred Rainier uh, and see some things and hear about these different companies that he had started up. He's still starting companies to this day. Uh, he's never going to stop. Uh, and he was a great guy and, and got to, I got to have him on my committee as well. Uh, so that was amazing. But then also um, when I learned uh, in my analytical my first analytical class uh you know digging in and finding that solution because you know organic we were making things and you know eventually you get there but a lot of synthesis is a lot of things that like well that didn't work or that route didn't work <laughs> or i need to get a lot more yield out of this um it was neat though i got to do uh and harry pardue who's an excellent chromatographer an excellent chemist uh i got to learn analytical from him uh and I think one of the analytical highlights for me, uh, it was when I got to, uh, in my advanced analytical class, it was a smaller class for us. And, uh, we got to learn mass spec from Graham cooks and, yeah. uh, Dr. Cooks is, is still somebody who is, uh, definitely an inspiration. And I've had a chance to, uh, still interact with him. I'm appreciative to still be in the community and still get to do that. Uh, and, and and I could name many more. I took biochemistry and Dr. Lau was in there. And meanwhile, he's got this company that's founded. Uh, so all of these things, uh, it was amazing. Yeah. And getting the chance to uh, to really learn from legends, if you will, and have them open the door to so many areas. Uh, it was wonderful. And then also seeing exciting new faculty come in. And uh, I remember when Dr. Wilker, Dr. John Wilker came in and he's putting fish tanks in the chemistry building <laughs> to grow muscles to study marine adhesives. And <laughs> I thought, wow, this is this is great, because for me, it, it just pointed out chemistry as that that real central science. And uh, so to learn from all these all these folks, um, of course, now some of these new professors that I remember are now full professors and uh, like Dr. Senna is the department head and, and remembering when they, they came in, it dates me, but uh, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely something that learning from folks who have really been so influential in their field. And again, I, I, I've only named a few and even more have come since then. Um, but you look around Purdue and that's everywhere. Uh, you know, learning that there's viral structures that are being discovered in structural biology, learning about some of the biomedical engineering advances that are out there, I, every place around, you could not, you couldn't turn around without seeing innovation happen and all these things. And for me, seeing those innovations that made that difference in human health, yeah. it's amazing. I, I totally agree. I, you know, and that I share that excitement and I live that excitement uh, on a daily basis here at Purdue. And I do feel so fortunate, as you said, to be working with these people. And I get to work really closely with many of them. And I'm so appreciative of being able to have that time. And I, I, I totally connect with you there. Um, Adam, there is this piece in your history that you spoke about and that you bring up again with Fred Rainier and Dave Nolte, which was this Quadraspec uh, company. Um, it, it, it was a startup 
company and I, you know, I, I want, I want to know, you know, what that was like for you to be in this startup mode. And again, like in many startup companies, it's either you make it or you break it. And it's, you know, it's very volatile, but there's a lot of excitement to tell us, take us back a little bit, if you can, to that time. Yeah, it was, uh, it was really interesting. And in coming in there, we're doing a lot of things. So we, you know, there was some basic technology was there. Uh, it was laser interferometry to detect uh, binding to different, uh, different antibodies on a, on this silicon wafer, a bio CD, they called it at the time. Um, and uh, so what we were doing, you know, I, I not only got to do some chemistry things, which was, which is very important, but actually the interesting things too were all the hats you had to wear because you're at a startup. You know, now I'm blessed to be at a place we have uh, at Avonic, we have like 700 people on our plant site here helping <laughs> to make drugs uh, to make life better. And, and we've got all this infrastructure and so many amazing things that are present. But in a startup, when you're number 11, uh, there's a lot of hats you wear. I was involved with our manufacturing chemistry area and we were still building out lab spaces. We had to have some clean room stuff. So I got to be there and I was interacting with construction contractors oh, wow. helping to set up a clean room. We were getting in this new equipment that we'd had the grants to get in to do some of our manufacturing from a, a high precision protein printer to uh, very mechanical like stamping devices uh, that were separating wells on these CDs. And so I got a chance to wear some hats that again, as a, as a farm kid, I was not opposed to picking up a tool and, and trying to fix something or, or help work on something. And I think that really lent itself well to me because I was willing it's like, Oh, you need to move this heavy thing. Let's get some folks together and let's do it. Uh, you know, that didn't throw me off because that's just what you do. Uh, so, so getting to experience things like trying to build out a space uh, for the work you're doing, helping to acquire instrumentation and acquire uh, technology. That was something that was really useful. And I used it every other place I was. I was set, I helped set up spaces for certain activities at both BASI and at SSCI. I had a chance to do that uh, and really got my, got my feet wet doing it there. We were setting up a GMP quality system. And so I got to be part of learning some of that. Thankfully, I'd had some a little bit of rooting in that at Lilly uh, from intern years, but that was something that you know, as a startup, you know, you're involved with so many aspects of it, and I think you get a chance to work with you know different people in other areas, and you also there's a lot of responsibility on you right away because there's not a whole huge team of people. We eventually built up some team uh, there. But there wasn't this this massive infrastructure team. You were having to put it together, and so I was thrust right into uh, managing people. I was thrust right into doing hiring. I was thrust right into you know facility design and and scheduling and all these other things. And it really was something that I was thankful that I got thrust into all of that, because what it did for me is it allowed me to see so many aspects of the job. And also to then appreciate later when I had had things that, oh, I, you mean, I don't have to do all of these parts. I get to just do this segment here, not the whole pie. Uh, uh, you know, that was really nice too. But, but yeah, I think there's, there's a really neat element of being part of doing something and, and having to touch a lot of parts of it and really flexing into other areas that are definitely uh you know, that wasn't my degree, but it was a lot of fun and, and something I really enjoyed the challenge because I like variety in things. Yeah. Um, I, I think one of the things that I like about that variety is I like the, uh, it kind of morphed into, Tommy, the this contract space. So I never, I other than my internships, I didn't work for a big discovery drug company. Mm -hmm. uh, I've worked in the contract space at every other place. Yeah. Um, and I like variety because I remember you know, talking to folks and, and some of them were really excited. They, they were working on this one class of molecule and they were the more of the discovery med chemists. 
and I love our discovery med chemists. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but for me, spending a bunch of time doing a bunch of different functionalization on a, on a molecule, I want to do different stuff. I want to explore some different chemistry. And so this contract realm, you know, I could be working on a cancer drug one day and an Alzheimer's drug the next yeah. and everything else in between. Sure. And so I think that's, that's what keeps it fun. So, so that startup atmosphere really fed that in me and it helped me realize I like variety and I need it in my work. Yeah. And it sounds like you thrived on that variety. Um, and in fact, by your activity too, like, you know, my gosh, you volunteer and you're part of the ACS and you're, you know, like you do so much, Adam, it's so admirable. It's, it, it really is. It, it seems like you seek variety in places also where you are giving back, where you are also putting in of yourself. And, and it's so, so commendable, really. I, you know, as you were, as you were, relating the stories here i mean you mentioned a variety of different as you said contract opportunities right here in such a small area um it's it's so it's so concentrated um the opportunities are plentiful right in terms of like the there's so much variety of different companies that are not huge companies and there could be huge companies like yours uh because Ivonic is a multinational you know German company and that you know like it's uh, again like there's that but then there's also smaller and startup companies and mid-sized companies I, you know, one question that people keep asking is, so uh, what was the interview process like? How, what did you say? What do you think were some of the good things that you said? And what would you tell people? Hey, don't, don't say that in an interview. You don't <laughs> want to be saying things oh. like that. Yeah, um, I think a couple things. Uh, and again, some of this wearing that career consulting hat um, never be talking about what you don't want to do. Uh, and, and, and also don't keep talking about what you want to do next or that, uh, I remember talking to somebody, I was doing a resume review and they kept wanting to say, well, when will I be the boss of people? When will I be the boss of people? And I'm like, and I'm thinking to myself, well, never at my company, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I mean, it, it's very true. Uh, but the interview process should be, you need to be able to be, be yourself if you're not able to be yourself in an interview there's something about maybe that company that's really probably not a good fit uh the relatability of the interviewer maybe that's not it and i'm not saying that every person that interviews you because you're going to have a series of them not every person that interviews you are you going to be thinking i want to be their friend uh, that's that's not the case and the reality is you you need to be able to work with them uh and you work with people from all backgrounds which you know, produce a great place to prep for that. But, you know, I think the interview process is in general, uh, my main interview at Quad Respect was with uh, our VP of manufacturing there. And you know, he's an organic chemist as well. And I, we were just talking and I kind of realized later, oh, that was my interview. And it went well because we connected. And so, you know, we were talking and we just continued to have some conversations, but that's that small startup. You got like one person and okay, there's somebody in HR, he, that also did 50 other things and they, you know, he worked <laughs> with that. Um, but then you look at other companies, um, there's usually teams of people, you, you do a presentation. And, and the thing I would say is anything that's on your resume, you need to know that document very well. And if you put it out there, you've got to be able to back it up. So um, when I did uh, some interviewing for, and I would always usually have some sort of a presentation when I did interviews at, you know, both, um, I would say I had presentations, not at the first company, but uh, at BASI, at SSCI, and then here at Avonic, I, I've had interview presentations uh, that I've done. And when you do that, you know, make sure you're ready for people to ask questions about little, little minutia of it, but also, um, a thing that, and this is something more that I 
did, uh, you would pick a technique that's on somebody's resume. If an, an, when I interviewed for analytical folks and they would have a technique on there, on their resume, that they were proficient at this. And so I'd ask them, well, tell me how it works. And sometimes you get the person who says, oh, I put a vial here, it sucks up liquid and it does this, goes through a column and at the end you get something. Okay, yeah, you're not getting the job. Yeah. Uh, you know, someone who tells me, I, I say, no, how does it work? Yeah. How does this technique work? Yes. And then they'll say, oh, you know, we, we're separating things based on how yeah. they're, you know, partitioning yes. between a mobile and stationary phase. Okay, yeah. now you know. So, so really, you've got to back up anything that's on your resume. I'm going to ask about it. And it's not that you want to hide things. Some people get nervous about gaps in a resume. And if you got a reason there's a gap, there's a gap. Yeah. Am I going to ask you about it? Absolutely. But as long as you've got a good story, I mean, some people have taken time off to care for a sick family member. That's yeah. admirable. I, I'm going to, that shows me you're loyal and that shows me, Hey, I'm going to, this is a person who's going to, you know, prioritize things well. And, and so this is great. Um, so that's, you know, some of that interview process is like that, but the weirdest thing for me interview wise was actually my interviewing for Ivonic because it was 2020. And there was a little thing called COVID going around uh, that kind of shut the world down a bit. So I job changed in 2020. And so as I'm going through this process, all my interviews were virtual. We were doing, I mean, thankfully there are things like Zoom and Teams, uh, so you can do that. But my interviews were virtual or phone. So you have to be comfortable with that. I think there's a lot of folks nowadays that uh, they're very good at texting on a phone, but if you're going to talk on a phone, you got to have conversation and not distraction. So that's, that's important. But, you know, I actually, I interviewed and it was, and I had an offer and, and that was of course contingent on like a medical exam. So it wasn't until I came to the health center at Avonic after I already had an offer that I stepped foot on this plant site as someone in the job. Now, back in the 90s when I was uh, inter when I you know was part of the student affiliates we did a tour out here one time but it it had been you know quite a while it'd been more than 20 years since I'd set foot on this plant site and here I was I was coming in to work and then uh, so that was very different and and having that virtual interview that was it was very artificial it felt like but you just have to practice being conversational over, you know, electronic means, if you will, uh, because if you let it, if you let it make it too formal, if you let it get to you, it will. Uh, so you have to be comfortable with that. Um, you have to prep a little more for that in some ways, and you have to. Your discomfort will show much more that way than it may show if you're in a room because you can usually work off of the room and kind of read the crowd. You cannot read the crowd when you are on the screen and your presentation and there's no other video there until maybe a Q&A period. Right, right. And yeah. oh my gosh, it must have been nerve wracking and impersonal, right? Like, oh, are you guys sweating? Because I'm sweating. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the good thing for me was at least I had already at that point had uh, phone interviews with their HR. I'd had phone interviews uh, with uh, the person that was my hiring manager at the time, and we had connected really well. Um, so that was, and of course, I had a friend who'd referred me here. And uh, because when you're in the pharma industry and you're in a smaller community, when people move companies around, you probably know where they worked before. Yeah. And so a good chunk of actually the analytical group here used to be <laughs> at, was it that I'd worked with at BASI and, and some other places. So I knew I had the privilege of knowing some people. And yeah. and also if you're connected in the community, which you know I have a chance, even there were people on my interview that I went to church with. So that made things pretty easy too. It was like, oh yeah. Okay, this is Kevin from church, or this is uh, this is my friend Mike who's referring me for the job. So, just knowing, knowing, and really thinking, yes, here are faces of people that are on the other side of that computer, even though I wasn't seeing them, I I knew their faces because I had met them before. Sure, sure. 
Well, and that, you know, that there's so much to say about that of uh, knowing them. And maybe it touches back to a point that you made early on about networking and, you know, how important that is. I, I mean, you and I are networking now. Uh, mm-hmm. And you've told me already a few things that I think, hmm, I'm thinking I'm going to call Adam later because we have a few potential projects that we could be doing between Purdue and Evonik and what, like, but this is how it starts. It starts with a conversation. It starts with reaching out and asking people, hey, do you have a little time to talk? And, um, um, you know, I, but but tell us, uh, like, are there, are there ways that you have found have been more effective to do some of the networking than other ways? Yeah, I mean, I think obviously now that we're finally getting back to in-person events, there's nothing like in-person networking. So there's a big American Chemical Society meeting. Uh, the spring meeting is coming and it's going to be in Indianapolis, which I'm super excited about because it's it's close. And also it's a good city laid out wise for convention. It's great logistics. So yeah. um, I like that. So I'm excited for that. You know, Going to a reception, um, don't just show up for the free food, even though we all know that's why a lot of people are there. But go <laughs> and, and try to learn something about somebody. Uh, And the other thing with networking is it's not about you. The conversation should really be, you want to be finding out about the other person. Uh, So don't try to, um, you know, be sort of a, don't be a serial networker and just be like, you know, trying to network with everybody. Uh, You know, don't be, don't be, I guess, loose with your networking, but really think about, uh, you know, I want to have, X number of, I, w- I want to meet one person, have a one meaningful conversation at each of these receptions I go to. Uh, yeah. I think that's a great way to do it. Get mutual introductions to people. Uh, the other thing too is as you are having this conversation, it should be a conversation. I always tell people when I teach some of my career workshops, you don't go up to somebody and shove a resume in their face and say, um, I hear you have jobs. I'd like a job. I, I'm a chemist. I want a job. You know, like you know, nothing turns you off more. It, it is a lot like dating. Let's be real. That's yeah. desperate. And no one, desperation is not attractive in employ, potential em- yes. employees <laughs> or in a potential dating partner in that. So, you know, it, you don't want that. But the other thing too, that you never can underestimate. And I think that my story illustrates is your networking doesn't just need to be in where you think it should be. Mm -hmm. So for example, my job through BASI, I got because, you know, my now wife, you know, we were, we were dating at the time. She's a elementary education teacher at that time. She's a high school guidance counselor now, but one of her fellow fifth grade teachers, husband worked there and we had gone out with them before we gotten dinner with them. And, and so he said, hey, I thought of Adam. We've got a job opportunity coming up. I hear he's looking. So it was actually through my wife that I, in elementary ed, that I got that. Um, I, on the side, I teach, uh, one day a week, I teach a group fitness class over at Purdue. I actually teach cycling in the mornings right now uh, at the Co-Rec. And, uh, and I have had great networking through that. Uh, I, I actually helped uh, somebody who was a chemi coming back to town uh find a job locally and so because he um his his now wife was doing her phd here so she was he was going to try to relocate back to the area and so we could connect there um and just these little networking opportunities uh because guess what everybody you know a lot of people in a lot of professions go to the gym yeah they go to the grocery they they are involved in other things uh you know now as a dad i'm like i'm sitting watching a a swim lesson and there's somebody next to me who you know they do something too and so i think don't try to you know don't silo your networking but let that networking come pretty naturally as you do i mean i've you know that's how i've connected with a lot of people over time and it turns out we actually have some really good professional connections and then connections that lead to you know, me finding new employees or me learning about new opportunities. And all of that is something that if you on the surface just say, I'm a chemist wanting to network with other chemists, I would have lost out. And 
that's and you don't want to lose out uh, yeah. because there's so many great opportunities and ones that come really natural. Yeah, and I love how you put that because you do miss out by not sticking yourself out there, right? And uh, and tr- at least trying and and having a strategy. I I like the way that you put that. It, let's have a strategy before you go to the networking event or whatever like have a goal so that you can you know measure your progress and Mm -hmm. and that that that's great i i i think my wife uh, complains or she makes fun of me to her friends that i'm always working because i'm always (laughs) i'm always networking Uh, but it's i understand (laughs) um but you know it i think that that really is is the the piece that i think a lot of people um might not realize is that the network it doesn't only have to be within your profession it's has to be wherever it is that you are at because you never know who's going to be connected to what or who's going to know about what and might think of you if you make a good impression with them or whatever it might be that you are doing with them. I I appreciate so much you saying that because I think there's this misconception that I have to go to my society conference or I have to go to that meeting in order to network. And that is very true, right? I mean, yeah, you find a lot of good opportunities there, but don't miss another opportunity by putting yourself out there and talking to other people about what you do, but also receptive about what they do, right? Yeah. And I mean, I think about it this way at at every company, uh, uh, again, when you're in a small startup, maybe you are also the janitor and the groundskeeper and the chemist. It could be, but the reality is that at every company we're at, you know, we have, you know, here at Avonic, again, we're we're pretty big. We're we're our own little city here. You know, we got our 700 people across the river from the airport. And- Uh, you know, we're pretty large people that work in our, you know, we have an emergency response team here. We have so many things all on site. And every one of those people, we we do employee referral programs. So, you know, we're incentivized and most companies will do this. You know, you're incentivized to try to recruit people to to your company because it's great. If you pick your coworkers, they're probably the people that want to hang around and you know that they'll like the company culture. Yeah. And so the reality is, it's like, don't discount it because you could, you know, as a, if you're a, a PhD scientist, yeah, sure. There are those of us here, but we got a lot, a lot of more people that are not PhD scientists that are here. And there are people who are in every walk of life. And so you never discount because guess what? There is only one like president of a company, but there's probably a lot more people doing maybe maintenance or grounds. than there are presidents of a company so that's way more connections in there and so that that's an opportunity you have to look for i mean still you want it's great if you can get to know know the top dog if you will but but at the same time it's all those other connections and when you make a real genuine connection a genuine connection lasts you a lot more than a random random hookup of of networking if you will yeah i agree a hundred percent um how do you how do you um how do you get either you know is it is it courage or confidence uh to go up to people and start talking to them how do you put some of the inadequate feelings uh as you go and approach them do you do you think about it do you think about what you're going to say how what what do you do you know, I, I thankfully had a lot of this modeled for me. Um, you know, even I will say this, when you grow up in a farm community, you know, everybody, you talk to everybody. <laughs> and so even as a kid, I, I had that imparted in me. Uh, you know, there are times that, um, and I'll say my wife says the same thing to me that, 
uh, my mom said to my dad, like, if we're trying to leave a place, uh, she was like, come oh. on, can we go yet? Yeah. Because again, I'm still, you know, connecting with folks there. Um, you know, I, I think that's, that's one of those elements that it can happen, but, um, you know, you have to, as you go in, I think, uh, initially, if you, let's say you're a student going to your first professional conference, uh, hopefully you're going to go with a couple other people. Maybe someone else from your research group is there too. So have, have your, uh, have your buddy, have your wing person there that can go with you. And that way you're talking together to somebody. And, and that's, that really, I think can make a difference. If someone is shy, find somebody who is less shy than you and hang out with them, go to the meeting together, go to a networking event together, and then just strike up conversation and, and figure out what a point of interest is that you want to know more. Because usually it's, it's easier for us if you, again, if you don't go into a networking situation thinking, this is how I'm getting a job. So you, you immediately put pressure on yourself. Don't put pressure on yourself right away. If you've attended a talk and somebody did, you know, the, the chemistry that somebody did or the science that someone did in that talk, uh, one particular thing might may, may have stood out to you. So take notes, find the one thing that stood out and go ask them or ask the person when you, when there's a talk and don't do it with just any, any talk. Like if you've sat in a whole symposium, there's probably one speaker that maybe their work was really more fascinating than others. Ask them what, what comes next. Because one of the fun things to know is, okay, well, this is really cool. And I know what you did there. What comes next? Or if something seemed really unusual, how they got to a conclusion, how did you get the idea to you know, fill in the blank? Those are some easy things. And start it with that technical, because you're, if you're at a technical thing, that's an easy way to do it. Um, but look for the common ground. Uh, even if you're if you're at the gym and you see the same person, uh, you know, basically you're like following them to the different stations of the gym because you both happen to do a similar workout. It's like, oh, Tuesdays is cardio for you. <laughs> oh, you know, maybe that's the conversation you have. And it can start with a small comment of just saying hi, uh, you know, introduce yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, obviously don't bother them while they're intensely on a treadmill and you know you're gonna fall but you know, just find the opportunity um you're sitting next to them at a sporting event um uh, you know something like that you know maybe it's a bad call from a referee we've had a lot of those in big 10 basketball this year but maybe it's maybe it's something like that and, and you just discuss with them uh, i've got we there was with how seating got redone in Mackey this year mm. i'm sitting next to some different people <laughs> and yet I've gotten to know them and, you know, we're all, of course, bonded together over our love of Purdue and, and all that. But it, it, little things like that can make a difference. Sure. Uh, sure. And, and I think that's that's the way to do it. Find the little thing. Find one question to ask someone. And if and here's the wonderful thing about something like that. If you've got if you are, let's say it's you're at a professional conference and you say you can ask what is the most important thing about being a member of fill in the blank society to you? Because yeah. guess what? That question can get reused with everybody. Yeah. So if you're shy, practice one question. <laughs> that one question can get you a lot of mileage yeah. because it can get you to a lot of different people over yeah. time. And I think that's, that's a, that's a great way to start with. It starts with one question. It starts with one interaction yeah. and that's what networking is. And, and don't force it. Cause if you're clearly uncomfortable, everybody's going to be uncomfortable. So. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, there's nothing worse than the uncomfortableness sometimes <laughs> that, dead silence or if we don't know what to say to each other. Okay. I gotta go. Yeah. I gotta go. Um, Adam, let me ask you, are there any questions that I didn't ask you today that you would like for me to ask you? Oh, wow. Uh, you know, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, and, and I would just say that the encouragement I have for, for people is just really, uh, you know, there's lots of paths. There's lots of people that are going to give you advice. Uh, but ultimately, you've got to discern for yourself what's going to be best. What my path has been, uh, you know, Tommy, what your path has been, that's probably not going to be the same path 
for everybody else. I mean, I think about it, we, you know, I, I looked like on your LinkedIn profile, we overlapped at Purdue during graduate school times, Yeah, but we never knew each other then. <laughs> no, no. Uh, we were on very different paths at that yeah. point. Uh, and everybody's path is different. You know, you've gone an academic route. I've gone industry. Yeah. But at the same time, I think that, uh, you know, one person's path is not everyone's path. And so find it. And I think in, as in careers, just know that you're getting the next job or the, the next opportunity. Uh, I think you can put too much pressure on yourself to find the only, because uh, reality is that most things, especially industrial jobs now, it's extremely rare to go and only work for one place. And even in academia, there's still more movement around, I think, than there used to be. So just realize that you're finding the next step along the path. And if you do that, if you find your next step and, and you're finding things that are good fits for you, you know, that's how you ultimately can, I guess, to, to quote the logo of the series, be a good pathfinder yeah, and, uh, and, and really kind of dive into to what that ultimate you know, journey professionally and personally is going to be for you. Yeah, and what a perfect way to to uh, put a, a nice button at the end of this interview. Uh, Adam Myers, Dr. Adam Myers, Senior Project Manager at Evonik. What a pleasure talking to you. Um, I wish we could continue talking. And what we should do is perhaps do a follow-up, a number two sometime, and hear some more of the exciting work that you're doing and also some of these tidbits and elements of success that you've provided today. Thank you so much for doing this and thank you so much for uh, opening up and telling us uh, a little bit about uh, how to succeed and at least in your path and for being our pathfinder today. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Tommy. It's been great and I'm thankful to have had the opportunity and glad to do it again if you guys want to. Awesome. Well, have a great afternoon, Adam. Take care. Thanks. You as well.